and we'll dig in. <clears throat> Romans chapter 13. Let's read together verses 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on, wrong, on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Is owed. Well, I know I've said several times over these last couple of weeks that it is with some amount of trepidation that I approach this text. And uh, I'm sure many of you over these weeks and maybe throughout your life, you've thought deeply about this text and what does it mean to apply this in our day? Uh, what does it mean? How does this go? Uh, but again, to even broach this topic in the public square, not even in the public square, but in, in our families sometimes, is to invite discord. It's to invite struggle. What are the two things you're never supposed to talk about? Politics and religion, right? Those things. And yet, first of all, religion is the most important one thing you can talk about, specifically the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, government or you know, the established authorities are so vital to our day-to-day -day life. We, we cannot say for a moment that what's going on and the laws that are in existence don't impact us. And yet, it is a difficult and dangerous topic to broach, not just today, but at any time. Think about our social media day. Think about whatever you say on social media, you will get ripped apart. You could be for a given government program, you'll get slashed and burned. You can be against it, you'll get slashed and burned. Think if, if you went on to social media or even in your own home and, and you began to ask these types of questions and you began to put forth opinions and thoughts. What is the role of, of the state in human affairs? What is the role? How are the state and church to relate to each other? <clears throat> what does it mean for a Christian to honor God in his or her interactions with the state. Again, you, you start asking these questions, you start bringing them up in diverse populations, and this leads to, at best, heated discussions. At worst, downright screaming arguments and riots and protests. I'm not alone in my fear here, or not alone in my trepidation. Here's James Boyce writing in the 1980s. What a source of controversy these verses have been. J.C. O'Neill, in Paul's letter to the Romans, and this was written in the middle of last century, wrote this, These seven verses have caused more unhappiness and misery in the Christian East and West than any other seven verses in the New Testament. That's probably not true, Boyce says, but they have certainly puzzled many and caused unhappiness among some scholars. Some of them like the one I just quoted, have attempted to eliminate the verses from the letter, reasoning that they are unpauline and come from a rather stoic source. Such persons think that the verses have been inter interpolated, arguing that verse 8 would follow nicely after 1221 and that there is nothing quite like this section anywhere else in Paul's writings. Well, I think there's definitely some truth to that last phrase. This is definitely fairly unique to him and what he's saying here and how he says it. 
He really doesn't deal with too much of this. Peter, of course, does. He, he writes to Timothy again and deals with it. But friends, this is, a, this is an interesting text. And again, if you've spent time with the Lord for any length of time and thought, what does it mean to be a Christian in society, you've obviously had to wrestle through this text. But, but let me say something, friends. I, I personally and many evangelical scholars don't think this text is out of line or out of order in any way, shape, or form. Consider again the gradual move from Romans 12 into this passage right now. Now, now again, just by way of review, what, what do we look at? We look at Romans and we say that chapters 1 through 11 are what? They're, they're the indicatives. They're the, they're the things that we learn about God, who he is, what he wants, what he's doing in time and history, how he saved us, all these types of things. And then starting in 12, 1, we have the imperatives through the end of the book. All the things that we ought to be doing now as a result of the truth of who God is. And so, rightly, we look at Romans 12, 1 and 2 and say this is the pivot or the, the center of the, of the wheel when it comes to Romans. Everything turns now around this. Everything that came before are things that we have to know. Now are the things that we do in light of what we know. And so if we consider the gradual outward move of Romans 12 into 13, what do we see? First of all, what? 12, 1 and 2, it's a Christian in relationship to God. And then 3 through 12, a Christian in relationship to other Christians. 13 through 21, a Christian in relationship to non-Christians and even enemies. And then today, what? A Christian in relation to the state. And, and I've mentioned this before about your priorities. What, what you need to, how you need to view your life biblically. Number one, the, the, the most important thing is what? You are a child of God. Your relationship to God is by far the most important thing about you. Jesus, Jesus says this, if you don't hate your husband, wife, kids, uh, your own life, what? You cannot be my disciple. Now, of course, we understand that that's a hyperbolic way of saying you are to love God far more, far more faithfully than you love your spouse, you love your kids, you love your job, you love your life. So, so there's that first absolute central aspect of who you are in Christ. Secondly, then there's this who I am in relation to other people. Specifically, you would say, I would say biblically that if you're married, that relationship right there is the second most important relationship. And you need to be working and fostering health there. And then, of course, you move into your kids. You move into your extended family. And I think Paul does this here. You move into the life of the church and other believers. And then what? You move into the outside of that. You start engaging with unbelievers. You start engaging with even those who are your enemies. And then somewhere in the realm of all of that is our role in relationship to government. And so, friends, I would argue clearly then that Paul's method or flow of argument, we can say with confidence that how we relate to government fits right in with it. How has one who has been transformed by Christ engage with and submit to the governing authorities? What does that look like? And as with these other admonitions, again, we have no problem, generally speaking, thinking, yes, that, that, that first relationship with God is vital. We have no problems engaging with the realities of what it means to be a godly person in the context of our family. We, we really don't struggle with what does it mean to be an evangelist and a witness in the outside world, even to those who would be our enemies. But boy, what do we do when we are faced with government? How do we engage there? And, and friends, again, it just flows right out of this. And if we're going to ask the questions about our relationship to God, our family to outsiders, then, then friends, it's just natural that we ask questions about what does it mean to live well with government. As we will see, these directives here that we're looking at, they're not unique to Paul. And as we'll see, he is developing his argument from the history of God's people. Yes, he's inspired. We'll talk about that. Yes, he's the inspired writer, but this just isn't coming out of nowhere. Well, one of, the, one of the things that's just continued to amaze me as I study Romans, yes, Paul is speaking inspired words of the Lord directed by the Lord to him to speak. 
and a vast majority of them are echoing or repeating the words of Christ, echoing or repeating what's been said in the Old Testament. And so, friends, what we're doing here is not unique, it's not new, it's biblical, and it's right, and it's good, and we need to wrestle it through. So the big idea that we're looking at today is this, and we might be looking at this over the next couple of weeks here. As transformed believers, remember, you have been transformed. You are being transformed. You are now what? A living and holy sacrifice. You are attempting by the grace of God and wisdom of God to discern God's will, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 1 and 2. As transformed believers, if that's you, we will embrace God's directive to submit to governing authorities. And I said will, not should. We will. Because this is what transformed believers do. It's what transformed believers do. So from this text here this morning, let's look at four keys to embracing God's directive to submit to governing authorities. Number one, the background of the directive. The background of the directive. Why this discussion? Uh, again, uh, we look at this, and we just read in 1 Peter what? That we're sojourners, we're aliens and strangers. If we read Paul in Colossians, uh, we understand that, that, that we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, we will also appear with him in glory. So we are otherworldly people. We're not to love the world. We're not to be engaged in the world, so to speak, in the sense of participating in their evilness. And again, there are many who understandably, maybe wrongly, but understandably say, you know what, I don't even need to worry about government. I don't even think about it. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. I don't need to deal with this. I'll just go do my own thing. Or we can just do our own thing. We can go become siege mentality people and go live in a, in, a, in a hovel somewhere or a cave and call it that and just be done with it. But, but friends, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? Why does Paul put this in here? One of the things that, that I do in sermon prep, and I know there's a couple other, I think Eric Loudenschlager does the same thing when he's putting together He's putting together his messages and Josh is going to, uh, I've been teaching him or having him read books on these types of things. When it comes to messages, the first thing, one of the first things you're asking in your study is what is the fallen condition focus? So all of us here are fallen, right? All of us are in a fallen condition. Therefore, we need God's instruction. And so we ask the question, why did God put this in here? Why do we as fallen people need to hear this. And as in all of life, submission and honor to others is counterintuitive to who we are, right? It's counterintuitive. We don't like things like this, just as natural people. Governments throughout history have been vicious and corrupt with various levels of goodness and wickedness. It's always going to be this way. Always. There's nothing new under the sun. There's some debate if Winston Churchill was saved or not, but whether he was or not, he had some wonderful quotes. And he said lots of good things. He said this, democracy is a horrible form of government, but it's the best one we have as wicked, broken people. He also, I think it was Eisenhower in World War II, he said there's only... One thing worse than fighting a war with allies is fighting a war without them. Friends, we're broken people, and our government systems are broken, and it's always going to be this way. And so, friends, as we look at this directive here, why did he put this in here? Why did God want this? Well, we need to recognize that this is counterintuitive to who we are. We don't like to submit. We just don't like to do that. And, and specifically, us in the West... But friends, the, the desire to not submit to governing authorities has been something that God's people throughout history have gone to. The Jews in particular, many of whom are now Christians and in the Church of Rome are a very nationalistic and restive bunch. They always have been. In recent history to this time, the first century, there's been the Maccabean Revolt from 167 to 160 B.C. against the Seleucid rulers of the day. It's a nationalistic, violent pushback 
against the Hellenization of Israel. The Seleucids, were, you recall, uh, they came in after Alexander the Great ran roughshod over that whole section of the world and tried to install Greek philosophy and life there, and the Maccabeans said, no! And, of course, many people were killed and all of these types of things. The Galilean Jews, specifically, were known to be rebels. They were known to be rebels in the nation of Israel. And so what? In Luke chapter 13, verse 1, we, we hear of this account that these Galileans come down to offer sacrifice at the temple, and as they're offering sacrifice, Pilate kills them. And remember the discussion about the, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, were these people worse sinners because of this? And he, of course, says no. But the issue is that Pilate, just because he was under the impression, rightly, that the Galilean Jews were more rebellious than others, just killed them, just did this. In Acts 18.2, it's recorded that the Jews of Jerusalem were expelled from Rome by Emperor Claudius. It's interesting, there's a Roman historian, he, he asserts that the reason that Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome was because of, quote, Crestus. We don't know who Crestus is, but there's some thought that it's a reference to Christ. And that these Jews and perhaps other Christians are kicked out of Rome because they're passionate about not submitting to the Roman authorities because they have no king but Jesus. None. In the not too distant future after this account, what? The Jews will rebel against the Roman occupation. And Titus will come in, the, the Roman general Titus will come in in 70 AD. He will absolutely decimate the city of Jerusalem, he'll kill thousands and hundreds of thousands of Jews by crucifixion, and he'll destroy the temple, not leaving one stone upon another, thus fulfilling Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24. See, see, this is just the nature of the Jews specifically. We'll talk about the Christians there too. Look at this outrageous statement from John chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. You don't have to turn that. I don't think I have it up here. Nope, I don't. But, but, but this is where Jesus is in debate with the Jewish rulers of the day, and they're having this contentious discussion. And, and Jesus says this. He said to the Jews who had believed in him, Roman, or John 8, 31, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. But then these Jews answer back to him and they say this, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. What? They've been enslaved to everyone. They're enslaved right now. And so they have this mentality that says, no one rules us. No one has that right. Here, here for Christians, and here's something that I think we probably wrestle with. Paul writes to the Colossians, he says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Friends, that's, that's a government statement right there. That's a statement of authority. That's a statement of who am I under? Who do I listen to? And the, temp the tempting thing, as it was for the Jews and Christians in Rome, in Colossae, throughout the world is to sit there and think, wait a minute, I'm a sojourner. I don't live here. This is not my home. I am an alien, a stranger. I have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. I have no king but Jesus. None. Therefore, I ain't listening to these worldly, godless, pagan rulers. I'm not doing it. He's not my president. Since I can remember, I've seen that bumper sticker. Every single term of the presidents of this country, he's not my president. So, so again, that, that's just inherent to all of us, Christian or non-Christian. We don't like to submit. Specifically, Christians have to wrestle with what does it mean to belong to God, through faith in Jesus Christ, there is one King and one Lord, and it's Jesus Christ, and I follow Him. How then do I relate 
to these governing authorities. What do I do? The background of the directive to submit to governing authorities is given to those who really struggle with it. And friends, that's everybody. That's everybody. Secondly, the foundation of the directive. The foundation of the directive. Read again chapter 13, verse 1. Let every person be subject. Now, now, again, look at the wording that he uses here. You should make yourself, he, he's not saying you should make yourself subject. You know, think about what it means to be subject. Maybe give it consideration. You need to actively choose to bring yourself into subjection to something that you're not in subjection to. Friends, that's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying. It's passive. Let every person be subject. Friends, what Paul is saying here is simply live in reality. You are, brothers and sisters, friends, you are subject to the governing authorities. Live in light of that truth. According to this passage, the government has authority. They have it. It's not up for debate. Not at all. We are to acknowledge and live in light of this reality. And again, as I've said, this tends to rile us up pretty quickly. Even in our own homes, we, we might say something like this. I, this happened years ago when I was a young high school age kid, I think. Maybe even earlier than that. I asked a family member to go and they were headed to the kitchen. I said, hey, would you grab me a Coke or something when they went? And this person turned around and said, who was your slave at this time last year? Things like that. Have you ever had someone say that to you? It's like, how dare you command me? How dare you even ask me anything? And that's just how we are. It riles us up. It riles us up. Who made you king over me? Who made you king over me? Well, Paul tells us here, the rest of verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Now, now, now let's, let's develop this a little bit. Let's take some time and just do some biblical background here. And again, this is why I say that when Paul writes this, this isn't new. This is, yes, the inspired text, but he is developing thoroughly biblical thoughts. Something that anyone in that day and in the days of the Jews, and in our day, who's serious about following the Lord, should know. God is the one who establishes authorities. Where does it start? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we tend just to blow over that sometimes. Okay, let's move on into the seven days of creation. Let's get through the fall, and let's get into redemption and all that type of stuff. All of that's well and good. But, but friends, as I've, as I've said before in my own life, as I've read, as I've heard, if we get this verse right, if we live in light of the realities of what this verse is declaring, then friends, our life through faith in Christ will be that which, generally speaking, is going to bring honor to God. It's going to do that. Because this verse and this verse alone, friends, tells us that everything in heaven and earth is under the authority of God, period. One of the things, you, you know, you, you get into some discussions about, you know, sexual morality and stuff like that, and, and, and people will say, well, well, Jesus never spoke out against LGBTQ stuff. I said, yeah, he did. How? He quoted Genesis 1 and 2. Matthew 19, he just quoted Genesis 1 and 2. And, and so, friends, what that means, and the way that we understand this, is that what is said here in Genesis 1-1 is all we need to understand that we and everything is under authority of God. Now, in kindness, in mercy, because we're thick-headed numbskulls, God elaborates throughout the rest of the scriptures of what it means to live a life of purity before the Lord. He tells us that. Because we're thick-headed numbskulls, 
he tells us what does it mean for us to submit to his authority. He gives us further examples of this. But friends, here it is, right here, first verse of God's holy word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Boom. You get that right? You wrestle through what that means? You think about how do I apply that within government actions? Then we're going to do okay. We're going to do okay. Not only that, look at this. Here's, oh, I'm sorry, back one. Jesus. Described in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and then closely all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Paul to the Colossians, maybe. All right. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, in reference to Christ. For by him all things were created, in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 verse 25 after he's been humbled he says this the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will thus we understand friends the application from all of these things and what Paul is saying here is we understand that the authority that government holds is a stewardship from God it's something that God has given to government and we, as biblical thinkers who view the world through the lens of Scripture, through the lens that God has revealed to us, we understand that the authority of government isn't something that they've come up with on their own. It's a derivative authority. But we what? Submit to it. We submit to it. Douglas Moo. From a human perspective, rulers come to power through force or heredity or popular choice. But the transformed mind recognizes behind every such process is the hand of God. The hand of God. The foundation of the directive is God's creation and the granted authority to governments. In submitting to government, we are what? We are obeying God. We are doing that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, let's look at some examples of the directive here. Submission to God through his established institutions is thoroughly and completely biblical. It's something we should be seeing all the time. What? There's governing authorities, maybe. There's governing authorities that we should submit to. That's here in Romans chapter 13, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Peter 2 that we read earlier, Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Spiritual leaders, elders in the church. Hebrews 13, 17, what does it say? It says, submit to your leaders and obey them, for they keep watch over your souls. Let them do this with joy. Let them do this with joy. So, so, so there's that other God-given authority. We're to submit to one another. We're to consider others more important than ourselves. Slaves are to submit to masters. Wives are to submit to husbands. Children to parents. Friends, again, all of these willing submissions are grounded in submission to God as the one who has established these hierarchies. And friends, you've all asked this question before. What does it mean for me to submit to someone who either a lot or a little isn't worthy of my submission? Maybe it's a child who's, who's trying to follow God and his parents hate that. They hate that. What does it mean for that child to honor unbelieving parents? And you're asking that question and you don't do it because the parent is worthy. You do it because you're commanded by God. Wives, why do you submit to your husbands? Well, I won't do it unless he, 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 he's a godly man. 
I won't do it unless he's really demonstrating leadership in my home. I'm not going to do it. He's not worthy of my submission. Well, I'm sure most of you guys know this. There's not one husband in this room that is worthy of your submission. It's just not the case. Every man should be striving to do that. But he's going to fail just like you're going to fail. And you choose, because of your affection and love for God and who he is and what he's done, you choose to submit. You choose to submit. Those of you that have little guys, most important thing that you need to teach them before they're five years old is that they're under submission to you, but that submission derives from God and you're pointing them in that direction. You're pointing them in that direction. What are some examples from Scripture of this, seeing these things? There's Joseph in Egypt. Look at how he conducted himself there wrongfully sent to prison, wrongfully sold into slavery. What does he do with Potiphar? Potiphar's wife wants to seduce him and take him to bed. And what does he say? How could we sin against God? So, so again, he understands that his ultimate submission is to God. How could we sin against God and sin against my master in doing this? The jailer. You know, he gets thrown into jail, wrongfully accused of, of raping Potiphar's wife. He gets thrown into jail, and within X amount of time, what? He's ruling the jail because he's submissive and respectful. And the jailer turns everything over to him. He submits to Pharaoh. Comes underneath Pharaoh, listens, obeys, and what? Pharaoh makes him second in the kingdom. And, and of course, he's seen all of this from the perspective of God. He says, as for you... To his brothers in Genesis 50 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Nehemiah, he's an exile, a prisoner, and the king brings him in to be his wine taster. Again, that's a fairly serious place, right? Because if someone's going to assassinate the king with poison, the wine taster drinks it, he falls over dead. And the king doesn't drink the wine, the king's fine. That was Nehemiah's role. And he conducted himself with respect. Daniel in Babylon, always honorable, always respectful. Even when he decided not to obey, he did so with respect. He did so with respect. Paul, unjustly prisoned, for over two years in Caesarea. And got behind Nehemiah, Daniel, Paul. Paul, unjustly imprisoned for over two years in Caesarea. Always respectful. Always willing to submit. Of course, Jesus is the prime example. We'll deal with this more over the next couple of weeks, but you know this statement in Mark chapter 12, verse 17. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Friends, we know based on that text alone that Jesus is saying Caesar or government has a role to play and you need to give what is due to them. You do it. And then most shockingly in John 19, 10 and 11, so Pilate said to him, will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. He, he, doesn't, acknowledge, he doesn't deny Pilate's given authority to put him to death. Jesus in his 33 years had probably watched many people get killed, crucified. Unjustly, probably. And of course, in saying this, he is going to Pilate and saying, Dude, you're going to give an account for what you're doing. And, and this is no excuse, and we'll, we'll get into this next week, but there's no excuse to joyfully submit to a government when it's doing ungodly things. But the fact of the matter is, friends, God has given them that authority. He's given them that authority. It is a transferred authority, and we need to submit to it and acknowledge it. Beloved, not only has God commanded us to submit to governing authorities, he's given us many examples of so doing. He's given us many examples of so doing. 
Lastly, this morning, how should we then live? How should we apply this directive? Well, number one, here's what it looks like. Joyfully, faithfully, diligently acknowledge this reality. Acknowledge it. Jesus, Paul, Daniel, Joseph, etc. Never denied even evil rulers' right to rule. Never denied it. Neither should we. Neither should we. Secondly, pray for our governing leaders and institutions. Pray. And let me just say, if you're losing your mind in our current day, and I understand, I get it, there's just some absolute craziness going on here. But I don't think you should be speaking publicly about the misbehavior of our current magistrates if you haven't prayed for them by name and are consistently doing so consistently doing so. Paul writes to Timothy, first of all then what I urge, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Are you doing this in this crazy day? Are you praying? Are you seeking to live a dignified and quiet life? And I'll, we'll get into this more, but, but friends, I think we just have an amazing opportunity as believers to just live a quiet, dignified life in an incredibly chaotic world and let the peace of Jesus shine through us. Thirdly, trust that no matter how bad it gets, God is in control and working for his glory and the good of his people. Israel has persecuted slaves in Egypt. Listen to this, Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you, yourself, and on your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. And then Exodus 9, 16, which Paul references in Romans 9. But for this purpose, God says to Pharaoh, I raised you up to show you my, show you my power so that my name be, may be proclaimed in all the earth. Friends, go back and just read those opening chapters of Exodus and look at how the Israelites responded to this. Look at how they were oppressed. Look at how they responded in anger. Look at how they responded in fear. And yet in the midst of it, what? God says this, I'm raising up Pharaoh for this purpose. So no matter how bad it gets, God is in control. He's working for his glory and the good of his people. You, brothers and sisters, determine that as a transformed believer in Christ, that you will be a blessing to all God-given authority, especially to governing authorities in our context. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17, which we looked at. Be subject, he says, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, to the praise of those who do good, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And as we've said dozens and dozens of times, the emperor at the time of this is Nero, perhaps the most wicked ruler to ever live. You name a depravity, he owned it and owned it all. He did this. And Paul and Peter, Jesus, others, honor, honor. So let me just ask you today, friends, what is your default attitude towards government? What is it? Friends, there's, there's a lot of questions that come up when we address things like this. When is, when is a government a legitimate government, and when, is it, when isn't it? So, so how many of you are following what's going on in Seattle and attempts of things going on like this? Is the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in Seattle is that a legitimate government or not? I'm not going to answer that today. What about in a coup d'etat? 
1984, I was flying from Nairobi, Kenya back to, back to the United States. I'd been there, I was 13, 14 years old. 12, 13, this was 1982, my bad. And the Pan Am jet, who remembers that airline? There's a couple of you. Yeah. The Pan Am jet that I was taking off, his big 747, was leaving Nairobi. And as it left, the Air Force of Kenya came in and took over the airport and attempted to do a coup. And after about a week, it was shut down after many deaths and violence and stuff like that. But, but those types of questions, at what point do, is a government a legitimate government and when is, when is it not? These are hard questions. When is it right to rebel against an unjust or tyrannical government? Or is it permitted at all? Does this mean we're to obey everything that they command? What about unjust acts committed by an evil government? What do we do with these things? Do we ever see in the Bible and outside godly people resisting government? And the answer to that, of course, is yes, we do. What does that look like? Well, come next week. Therefore, verse 2. Whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Can you see why I'm a little trepidatious about preaching this passage? <laughs> it's kind of tough. It really is. But what I want you to walk away from here today, friends, is this. As transformed believers, what? We will embrace God's directive to submit to governing authorities. That should be your default attitude as someone who follows Jesus Christ. That should be your heart's desire. How does that work itself out in a given place, in a given time? Hard questions. But you, brothers and sisters, are to let your light shine before men in whatever government situation it's in, before men, so that they would see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. May the Lord bless the preaching of the word. Let's pray. Wow.